Hey guys, Jared Wesley here of Live Traders, and it is that time of the week. It is lecture time, and this week's topic, guys, is on being objective, trading the charts. There are too many of you out there that are using subjective analysis, intuition, emotions, and it's costing you a lot of money, okay? So a couple comments on today's lecture. We're gonna talk a little bit about fundamental analysis versus technical analysis. We're gonna talk a little bit about subjectivity versus objectivity. We're gonna talk about buy setups and what a good buy setup looks like versus a crappy buy setup. So we're gonna talk about a lot of different things in today's lecture, and I want you guys to understand here that the charts are objective. Okay, they are the flow of money. Every time somebody places a trade, that trade forms a tick, that tick forms a bar, that bar forms a chart. Those charts form trends and those trends form patterns. Every single person who bought or sold that stock is represented in that chart. When a CEO goes on television, they lie. When an earnings report comes out, sometimes they're manipulated and they can lie. When an analyst says buy or hold or sell or strong buy, whatever, they lie, okay? I know you think they're out there and they care about you and your best interest. A little hint, they don't, okay? None of those analysts are doing that. They have a job and that job doesn't and their agenda doesn't mean helping you, okay? So you have to understand those things. So I'm not against fundamental analysis at all, but there's a place for fundamental analysis. And if you think I'm wrong on that, go take a look at GameStop's fundamentals and tell me why the stock's over $200. Go take a look at Tesla's fundamentals and tell me why that stock is a $600. It doesn't make any sense. Future growth? What, 25 years from now? I don't think so. My point is the market can stay irrational longer than you can stay solvent. So use technical charts to make your decisions. Use an entry price, a stop loss, and a target, okay? So be objective. We are gonna talk about it in great detail in today's lecture. Also, stop watching the news and the TV when it comes to trading. They don't care about you. I mean, Maria Bartiromo's nice and all, but she doesn't care about your trading. Jim Cramer doesn't care about your trading. The CEO is just on. By the way, most of them, they pay to be on TV. You probably didn't know that, did you? Most of them pay to be on those programs. Not all, but some. They don't care about you. They have an agenda, and that doesn't include your well-being or your best interest, okay? So today's lecture, guys, is a very powerful one. Again, three different topics in there, uh, so I hope you guys enjoy that. If you do like these lectures, please hit that like button, hammer, smash that subscribe button, and don't forget those little click notifications, that little bell down there. I am Jared Wesley of Live Traders. Let's get to it. This week's lecture topic is be objective and trade the chart. So this is a little bit of a continuation um, from last week, right? Where um, we talked about hedge funds manipulating the market, banks manipulating the market, like, you know, just everyone but us <laughs> manipulating the market. So we're going to talk a little bit about that. Not much, just a little bit. Um, but today's topic really is going to be on objectivity versus subjectivity. Uh, we're going to talk a little bit about buy setups, what a good buy setup is, what a bad buy setup is, meaning we're going to look at charts to show objectivity versus subjectivity. Okay. So uh, it's a, I don't want to call it a mishmash. It's not. There's definitely a flow to it, um, but there are, are multiple topics that we're going to cover in here, but they all relate back to trade the chart, trade the chart, trade the chart, because I think uh, many of you guys are putting your subjective opinions on the chart and not looking at the objective price points uh, on a chart, and it's costing you money. Uh, it happens all the time. I mean, people look at a stock, but it's really strong, and so what? It's up six bars, and you can't trade it. Right, and then what happens is that stock that's up six bars goes up eight bars, nine bars, and you go, see, I, sh I should have taken it, Jared. That's not what we do, right? So there are plenty of times, and this is, this is a really hard one for new traders to wrap their head around. There are plenty of times when you can look at a chart and go, man, that thing looks higher. That thing looks lower, absolutely looks higher or lower. And we don't take it because we're pattern traders, right? There's a method to our madness. Otherwise, you're just basically hacking around using intuition. But before we get into this lecture, we have to talk about when will the insanity stop? When will the insanity stop? Um, this week's not quite as egregious as some of the previous weeks, but the concept of it, the point behind it is 
it's disturbing, I suppose, uh, because I think the vast majority of the world works this way. And this is one of the things that I always found fascinating. Some of you have heard me say this in the past is, you know, nowadays it's become much more acceptable to be a day trader, right? Wall Street bets and Robin Hood and Reddit and Weeble, all the, you know, these companies have made it far more acceptable, you know, for day trading to be relevant. Um, but, you know, for anyone that's been doing this for any period of time, you used to know, come on, people say, hey, what do you do? I'm a day trader. Oh, how's that going? Right. That deer in the headlights looks like, oh, man, he's a gambler. She's a gambler. Oh, boy. Right. Um, so now it's much more acceptable. And the reason I find it fascinating is because, well, the average investor is a gambler. Fact. The average investor is a gambler. They buy something because they hear their taxi driver say it or their best friend has a tip or their aunt's uncle's cousins, brothers, sisters, you know, divorced second wife said, yes, this is the one. And they magically go and put a ton of money into it. And then they, what do they do? You know what I mean? They just sit there and hold it forever. Not a, not a good approach. OK, so that's kind of where this when will the insanity goes to. OK, so. Here it is. In various investments, I've been as been down as low as 70%. Stopped looking and set an alert when alert came made 50 grand. 70%. Okay? Here's another one. An answer or a reply to it. Down 60% twice now. Rebounded plus some. The first time just waiting for the second rebound now. So the first one came back and the second one hasn't come back yet. Rule number, this is obviously a joke, but rule number 312B, unless you can watch your crypto holdings, quote, life savings, decline by 80% within two weeks without becoming panic stricken, you should not be in the crypto market. Okay. I mean, guys, is this investing or gambling? Right. I mean, no, not. And I should have put the charts in here. Not every company comes back. Tell me right now. If you own GM or GE from 20 years ago, how are you feeling right now? How about WorldCom? How about MCI? How about Enron? Some of these companies don't ever come back. So for you to lose 70%, 60%, 80% with no plan in sight, I know a ton of people um, because it was popular at the time that got hammered in Dell. I know some folks that bought Dell at 50 and got out at 15. Okay. Now, my point is, is just because it's a long-term investment, doesn't mean it's a buy and hold forever. And no, despite what some people think, Warren Buffett does not buy and hold forever, okay? He does get out of some of his positions, okay? So just because you heard something from somebody like, hey, this new energy drink, you know, this new buy energy drink is the thing, you don't put your whole portfolio into it. You don't just back the truck up and say, okay, close my eyes, I'll come back in 27 years. The only thing you do that with is a total market fund. That's it. OK, but if you're going to buy individual stocks, never put more than one to 10 percent in one position. Ten percent is quite a bit to have in one position, by the way, depending on the size of your portfolio, of course. But to let something go down 60, 70, 80 percent just because you think it's going to come back. Wow. You know, wow. All right. So that's this week's When Will the Insanity Stop? The reason I thought it was appropriate is one, these people are being stupid. And two, were the gamblers? We have an entry price, a stop loss, and a target, and we have strict money management rules, but day traders are the gamblers and investors are not. That's a joke. And you want to know why so few people retire rich in this country? Because it's a joke, all right? Because they don't even know how to invest. They don't know their ass from a hole in the wall. All right, let's dig in. So today's topic, guys, we're going to talk about know your approach, technical versus fundamental. So know your approach, technicals versus fundamentals, all right? I think there are a lot of people out there that pick one side or the other, but what they don't understand is that most banks use both. Most hedge funds use both. In fact, there are far more technical funds these days than fundamental funds because of the advent of what? High frequency trading machines, right? So they don't use a lot of fundamental data. They use certain news reports and things of that nature, but they're mostly technically related. So you need to know your approach, okay? If you don't, then you're, you're in trouble. So here's the thing. How do we determine prices versus how do they determine prices, okay? A general belief about the value of a current asset or stock based off of future earnings, that's fundamental analysis, right? Future earnings. Now, is that a terrible thing? 
No, it's not a terrible thing, right? I mean, it, it, there's nothing inherently wrong with it. But you ever heard that the market can stay irrational longer than you can stay solvent? You ever heard that before? Well, we've seen this. Tesla, hey, here's one for you. I know you've never heard of this company. How about GameStop? What? Future earnings? GameStop loses money, at least the last three or four years it has. Why is it a $200 plus stock? So fundamentals can absolutely be irrational, all right? Now, someday, perhaps those earnings will catch up with the stock price, all right? Or the stock price will come down to the earnings, however you want to look at it. But a lot of people put their money, they hang their hat on fundamental analysis. When we all know CEOs go on television and they lie. Okay, we all know that books get cooked sometimes, right? You ever hear that accounting firm issues, right? Well, there's there's definitely an approach or an agenda behind what some of this fundamental analysis relies upon. Well, if you can't trust the basic information, which is the accounting or the CEO's opinion or his, it's not supposed to be an opinion, right? It's supposed to be based off of fact. But if you can't trust what that CEO says, or if you can't trust that company's accounting, how can you trust fundamental analysis? Think about what I just said. If you can't trust where the information's coming from, how can you trust the analysis to be accurate? It's pretty challenging, isn't it? Well, technical analysis, a general belief about the value of a current asset or stock based on current prices versus historical prices and represented in chart form. Okay, now, does this mean that technicals are perfect. No, there is nothing perfect in this world, but you're gonna get a more accurate representation of what a stock is actually doing because you're basing it off of the real flow of money, not someone's opinion about the future. You're basing it off of actual real flow, right? You guys have heard me say it before. When somebody places a trade, that trade forms a tick, that tick forms a bar, that bar forms a chart, that chart forms a pattern, and those patterns, right, they form money to us. So we're taking what people have previously thought, not what we think they thought, what they actually thought. There's a difference, right? Not what they think they thought. Look, it's hard to explain, some of you maybe not been in the industry, but I know it's crazy to you, but Analysts are just people, just like doctors, and they're not perfect. And when you take an imperfect person and you apply outside pressure to them, well, you're going, what do you mean outside pressure, Jared? They're, they're honest people. Oh, no, there's lots of pressure on analysts to upgrade and downgrade. There's lots of pressure on companies to show a good earnings report. What does those things do? There's lots of pressure when a CEO goes on television and says something. It's all for the betterment of the company, not for the betterment of your investment, for the betterment of the company per se, even when they lie. And when they lie and get caught, then it's really bad for the company, okay? So both fundamental and technicals are analyzed using multiple time frames and multiple periods. One puts more weight on subjectivity, fundamentals, and the other one puts more weight on objectivity, technicals. And why is that? Because technicals actually talk about the real flow of money. Now what a CEO says, what actually is happening in the marketplace, okay? So by viewing technical analysis charts, we are using actions, which are simply people's emotions manifested in chart form, i.e., we use past price action, emotional-based buying and selling to determine future price movement. Why? What's the basic premise here? The basic premise here is this. Human beings are consistent. Fear and greed run the world, period. This last year with COVID, you mean to tell me fear doesn't run the world? Heck, the CNN CEO was caught saying just that. All right. So my point is humans rare. Like you ever hear the, the phrase leopards don't change their spots? Human emotion doesn't generally change too much. Our core beliefs, our core emotions are pretty much the same, which is why charts have worked since the beginning of time. And it doesn't matter what you chart. I don't care if you chart pet rocks. You can chart sock sales for all I care. Okay. Pencil sales. I don't care. There is a chart there, all right? So we use those charts to help predict future price movement. It's not always perfect, but it's a lot less subjective than fundamental analysis, okay? We talked a little bit about this last week, but this is a, a slide that wasn't in there last week. All right, so check this out here. These ratings are largely based on fundamental, all right? Buy rating, 
the stock just ripped from 60 bucks up to 240 and you get a b -b 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 buy rating okay the stock pulls back buy rating stock pulls back reiterate buy rating stock pulls back some more now it's a strong buy rating and then it finally gets down to 20 dollars and it's downgraded to hold what the what are you kidding me and you don't think that there's an agenda behind this how does a company or a stock go from 240, let's call it down to 100, right? Down to here. And you're calling this a strong buy rating. What? Something fundamentally had to change at this company. All right? Now, obviously with the advent of Wall Street bets, that may or may not be the case. Because, well, that's just fantasy stuff. Like GME shouldn't be worth what it is on, on paper, right? AMC shouldn't be worth what it is. But this was before that, all right? This chart's a little bit older. How can you put a buy rating on a stock that's on a climactic sell setup? How can you reiterate that buy as it just tumbles? And finally, when it gets to the bottom, they're not interested in your well-being. They're not interested in what's good for you. They're interested in what's good for the company. Maybe they need one last spike to get out of their position, all right? Trade the chart. Or the news, you decide. To me, I'm going to stick with the chart. Okay, I'm going to stick with the chart. Now, what are we really doing? See, if you don't understand what it is we're really doing, then you can't be a technical trader. All right? At any given time, there are millions of people, traders in the market. That's the truth. At any given time, traders, investors, hedge fund, doesn't matter. HFT firms, pension funds, core traders, banks. Tons of people, a broad base spectrum of people, okay? All of these people are using various forms of information to take positions in the market. Some people are taking their neighbor's opinion. Some bank analyst is taking an earnings report. Some trader is looking at a chart, but we're all using different information, okay? Some of the information is sudden and it lasts for just for a couple seconds. Boom, a news report comes out. Wow, I didn't realize that the CEO stepped down of Microsoft, whatever it is, right? And other information is developed over longer periods of time, right? Like a sales figure or an earnings report, okay? Some of those things, that's taken a quarter or months or years to develop that, okay? It comes down to something very simple, their opinion about the market versus our opinion about the market using different forms of information. And let's be frank, everyone thinks their form of information is the right form of information, right? Their Uber driver. Oh, I guess that's a trustworthy person, right? So it all depends on what you believe. And this is what makes the market go round and round and round. You ever get that point? We talk about it frequently around here. When you see a stock up 17 bars in a row, you go, who's buying that? Well, their information says it should go up 18 or 19 or 20 bars. They think the stock's going to 1,000. Why would people buy Tesla at 900? Because they think it's going to 1,000. Why would you buy Tesla at 1,000? Because you think it's going to 1,100. Why would you buy it at 1,100? Because you think it's going to 1,200 and you're basing that off of something. Could it be intuition? It could be. But what's the intuition based off of? Probably something you read or heard. If you're a trader, why are you doing it? Because the chart says you should or you shouldn't. Okay? So the issue is we don't always know when their opinion will change. Through the use of charts, though, we can be relatively accurate. However, we're going to be wrong sometimes, which is why we use stop losses. So we're using charts because the chart tells us the real actual flow of money, right? It tells us what's really happening. There, there's no disillusionment about what's happening. It is. That's it. Plain and simple. See, you can guess if a company might beat or exceed earnings. You can guess at a buy or a hold rating, but you can't guess and tell me Something other than the SPY is at 424.45 right now. That is a factual statement, period. Okay, there's no guessing there, all right? Therefore, consistency for us is king, leaving no place for emotion-based decisions. Get used to reading the charts. I promise you guys, the back half of this lecture is all slides. For those of you that get bored with chart, or uh, uh, what should we call it, text slides, it's all charts after this, all right? Be objective. What is subjective analysis? Based on or influenced by personal feelings, taste, or opinions. Personal feelings, taste, or opinions. That's subjective. Get used to reading that. Opinion. 
objective, not influenced by personal feelings or opinions, considering and representing facts. A fact. 42445 is where the spy is. That's a fact. Okay? Truth lies in the charts because price represents what is actually happening. People lie, CEOs lie, hedge fund managers lie, governments lie, charts don't lie. And what's the problem in trading? You lying to yourself. That's the number one problem for traders. You lying to yourself. Saying you know it's going to do this, but your action does the opposite. Saying you know this is an aggressive trade, but you take it anyway. Saying you know you shouldn't get out here, but you get out anyway. You don't know it because you wouldn't do it if you really knew it. If you really believed that you shouldn't get out here because you're going to make more money by not getting out here, you wouldn't get out here. But you don't obviously believe it because you got out. One of the biggest problems in trading is twofold. Selling too soon, not taking stop losses. I see those are the most common comments I get. Selling too soon, not getting out when you're supposed to at a stop loss. You're lying to yourself. So we sit here and we say we are objective chart analysis traders. But we're not because we're lying to ourselves. You may have used the chart to get in, but you use your intuition to get out. That's a problem. So facts don't care about your feelings. And if you believe something, let your actions speak louder than your words, right? If you believe it, then let your actions prove it, plain and simple, okay? So what are we going to do? What are we really doing, per se? We need to get rid of the subjective analysis, period. End of discussion. How? Use a systematic method, okay? It's going to build consistency. Consistency is going to build confidence. And discipline and confidence in your approach or method equals money. That's it. It's so freaking simple. But it's really damn hard. Right? I mean, everyone can sit here. Oh, yeah, I'm just going to get rid of the subjective analysis. I'm going to need a systematic method or approach. Um, it's going to help me build my confidence through consistency. I'm going to apply discipline to it. I'm just going to make money. Well, yeah, duh. One plus one is two. But we don't always follow it, do we? Well, but, you know, I mean, the market's pulling back right now. And the last time this happened, it stopped me out. And I don't want that to happen again. And I know I shouldn't do it. But, you know, I want to protect that winner I had this morning. And, you know, I don't want to give any money back. What? That's all a subjective opinion. If the plan says don't do it, you don't do it. That's it. Done. Okay. You guys saw this last week. I'm not going to spend much time on it. Everybody manipulates the market. You know what you don't want to have happen? Wait for it. Listen up. Stop manipulating yourself. It's all you're doing. You're letting outside opinions influence what the chart is not saying. The chart didn't tell you that. You're, that's your opinion or that's you know your intuition telling you that. Stop it. Stop manipulating yourself. Okay, corporations do a good enough job of manipulating the markets in general and playing games and all this hype you read online. Erase it, eliminate it. Stop watching television while you're trading. Stop listening to outside influences. Put yourself in a little bubble and follow the flow of money, which is the chart. That's it. Okay, now we want to talk a little bit about objectivity in charts. All right, so. Briefly, I'm going to go over this. I'm not going to go in detail about buy setups. You all know what a buy setup is, okay? Lower high, lower high, lower high. Two or more lower highs in an uptrend. Preferably a sequential pullback, which is about 50% overlap, okay? Lower high, lower high, lower high, lower low, lower low, lower low. About. These might have a little more than that, okay? You're going to buy right there, and it's going to go higher. That's a basic buy setup, okay? That's a basic buy setup. Everybody can look at that and go, yeah, it looks good. How does this manifest itself in a chart, though? Well, objectively and subjectively, very differently how it manifests itself in a chart. Okay, everyone can look at this when the market's closed and you have plenty of time to think about it. Okay, and sure, some of them are very easy, right? Here's a stock that's clearly in an uptrend. It broke out, moved higher, consolidated, moved up, pulled back to an area of support, had a little small bottoming tail there. It's about a 50% retracement. It's above the moving average. There's a little green bar. You get in right here. Your stop's over here. Oh my goodness. Duh. 
Well, why? Because it's after the fact you're reading it. You can see that it worked. You can see it went from 38 to 44, $6 on a $2 stop, three to one. But what happens if you take this trade and you get in and it starts to chop around right here? Right there, it leaves a topping tail at 41.50 or something. And then the market starts tanking red. Granted, it's a weekly chart. Oh, well, you know, I am up one R here. Maybe I should just take it. Or maybe I should sell half my shares. Does your plan say to? No, but you know, I wanna lock in some profits here. I remember that last buy setup that I took, you know, and I was up about an R and it just came back and stopped me out. And then it goes higher right after you get out of it. And then you tell yourself, I knew it. No, you didn't. You didn't know shit. If you knew it, you wouldn't have got out of it. Right? That's it. Actions speak louder than words and facts don't care about your feelings. The fact is you didn't know because if you did, you wouldn't got out of it. Okay? That's it. So stop with the subjectivity. You used objectivity to enter this trade and subjectivity to get out of it. All right. Now, the problem is when you use subjectivity for both, to get into a crappy trade and then stay in the crappy trade, right? Do the exact opposite. You got in here with objectivity and got out with subjectivity. What happens when you get in with subjectivity and out or stay in it with subjectivity? Both, right? So we'll look at a couple more. Now, like I said, we're going to combine things here, all right? I told you that pre-market or pre-market, pre-lecture. We're going to combine some things, all right? Objectivity. Sequential move lower is what the definition of a buy setup told us. Lower high, lower high, lower high, lower high, right? Overlapping congestion is bad. Now, is this the world's worst congestion? No, it's not. But this red bar is something you must consider. So when this stock pulls back, the move back up could be very challenging. The pullback could be choppy. We don't want overlap. We want smooth sequential moves. Why am I bringing this up? Because this is objective. Objective is a 50% overlap with lower highs and lower lows. Well, this is objectively telling me there's congestion over here. So why take the buy setup? You wouldn't, but you do it anyway right? The sequential move lower creates void on the way back up. Overlap creates congestion, which creates or equals resistance. I'm showing this to you because this is part of being subjective. We know what the objectivity tells us. Sequential move lower, 50% retracement, higher lows, lower highs, rising moving averages, bottoming tails, green bars, volume spikes. We know those are all objective things. Your subjectivity comes in when you go, well, the market's moving up, so this has to move up, well, but it's still congested. You shouldn't take it regardless. Yeah, but the market's moving up. It's not something you should take regardless. So stop trying to manipulate yourself. Just move on from it. Sit there and go, no, that's not the kind of buy setup I want to be caught in. So I'm not going to take it regardless if there's relative strength, regardless if the market is moving up. This is something you put an X over and say, I'm not going to take it, but you will anyway. We know you will. You've done it. I see it all the time. Okay, so here's an example of what you want to see. Here's a stock that gaps up, chops around, and then rips. Okay, goes from 1340 to 1440, pulls back, lower high, lower high, lower high, right to support, bottoming tail, doji bar, and you get back in it. Okay, that's a clean pullback. There's not really overlap. There's one little bottoming tail there, which could be a concern, but these next two bars take care of that concern. Okay, that's a good buy setup. That is a good buy setup. This is a stock that gapped up to 52, which is taking out a lot of the congestion to the left. It chopped around, very sloppy. No, you're not gonna buy it at 51.80. It rips higher on two bars, two wide range green bars, and goes lower high, lower high, lower high, lower high. That's a concern right there. See how you have the bottoming tail right there? It should not have taken out the bottoming tail. But this engulfing, this green bar, I should say red bar ignored, makes this a better trade. So initially you were going to get in on this bottoming tail doji bar, but then this happened. So it's just as good or even better because now you engulf the red bar. The sellers came in and the buyer said, no, 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 I don't think so. Okay. So this is, ends up being a nice clean buy setup sitting at support. All right. Now, what about this? Why am I bringing this up? 
You guys know that when I'm in the chat room, I take pictures of charts all the time. All the time I do this, okay? And I label those pictures with comments, all right? This is being brought up, and this was a couple few months ago, because somebody brought this up as a nice buy setup. They brought up and said, Jared, what do you think of BA on this, this five-minute buy setup? Do you like it? No, I don't. The gap up started off pretty good. It did, right? You're gapping up over a couple pivots here to the left. You're in an area in which you'd want to be in. Then it leaves a topping tail doji bar and then another topping tail and a one bar pullback. Technically, technically, you do have a lower high and a lower high and a lower high. You do. That's, I mean, not by much, a couple few pennies, there's a lower high there. You pull back, there's a lower high, a couple few pennies, lower high. But what do you have here? Big red bar, topping tail bar, tons of overlap here. This bar overlapping that bar, this bar 100% overlapping this bar. The fact that this pulled back to the high and failed is not a surprise, right? It's just not a surprise because it's not a clean buy setup, right? It's junk. It, it really is. It's junk. It's not something. But what happens? What do people do? They get caught up in the gap. But it's such a nice gap. It is. It's a nice gap from what we can see here. This stock left a topping tail red bar. You can see it on the five minute chart, right? It retested here and now here's where the topping tail comes in. So it gaps up, fails, bounces, fails. So it left a topping tail red bar and you're gapping over the topping tail red bar. Well, I guess, and I understand why you would be influenced by that gap. And that's okay. There's nothing wrong with the gap, but there's a lot wrong with this. So you wouldn't take it. Don't let your influence or the gap manipulate this terrible five minute buy setup. Okay, don't take it. But what about this? What about this? Good buy setup. What do we have here? This is a daily chart, chopping around, moves up, pulls back, moves up, pulls back. What do we have going on here? Well, we have a big bottoming tail. That's usually a good thing. But Luke just hit the nail on the head. It's got a lower low. And then Angel said the same. Look at the double top. That's a peekaboo higher high. What we call a weak new high. That's what this is referred to. This red line here, this pivot where my cursor is, that's considered a weak new high. That's not a sign of strength here. And then it doesn't pull back 50% and bounce. Pulls back 100 plus percent, 110, 120% after a weak new high. What is all this screaming to you right here? Weak new high, lower low. It's not as strong as we thought it was. Right over here when it was bouncing, even though it's a sloppy pullback, it's bouncing. You're thinking to yourself, okay, well, maybe if it consolidates around the red line, maybe, right? A perfect world would have been this stock going up to about 150 and then pulling back to 145, but that's not what happened. And then that go that happens. Why did it fail? We just talked about it. Why did it fail? Because it put in a weak new high, which means it's not that strong, and then put in a significantly lower low, which means it's not that strong. That's a sign of weakness. That's a second sign of weakness. You are not buying us. How many of you would have? A lot of you. You would have. I know it for sure. The bottoming tail would have sold you on this thing. And then it peekaboos up. Slap, slap, slap. This is a bad buy setup. But the bottoming tail, one out of five things, meaning... You could find, remember we always talk about when you look at a chart, look for what's wrong with it. Look for a reason not to take the trade. If you can't find a reason not to take the trade, take the trade. Well, we have a couple reasons right off the bat. So don't let the bottoming tail override the fact that it has a weak new high and it put in a lower low. Don't let one little thing manipulate the bigger picture. The bigger picture says, don't take this. You shouldn't. But many of you would get caught up in, but it's close enough to the double bottom retest. And you know, it does have a bottoming tail kind of near some support. Really? Overlapping bars, weak new high, no way. Don't take it. Now, what about this? Put this one in here on purpose. Gap up, rips. 
okay? I don't know at the moment if this is a great gap up or extended or not, but that's not the purpose of this particular chart. So it moves up, shows a lot of strength, 51 to 52.40, right? Shows a lot of strength. Puts in a red bar, leaves a topping tail, pulls back, leaves a bottoming tail, engulfs the green bar. What do you guys think here? Lower high, lower high, lower high. Big bottoming tail. I wouldn't take it. Look at the overlap on this bar. It's about 90% overlap. The second bar leaves a bottoming tail. Not bad, but it pulled back pretty good after a big move up. Where is that sequential pullback right here? You don't have it. There's a lot of overlapping slop right here. Would I have been more interested in taking it at 52.50? Yeah. So what do we do here? Would I take it at 51.50? No, because now you have a lower pivot high and another lower low. The only way or place you can take this at this point in time would have been at $52 after it takes out the area in which it failed. Right? I wouldn't have taken the original entry because there's way too much overlap here. Weak overlap. Okay, so until this green bar comes back towards the high and proves to me it's strong enough to take out these bars, I'm not taking that buy setup. Lower high, lower high, lower high. Sure. What's the one thing that sells you all on this? Admit it to yourself. What's the one thing that sold you on this buy setup? It's the bottoming tail. If this doesn't have a bottoming tail, there's no way in hell you're taking this thing at 5160 or whatever this area is. That bottoming tail manipulated your mind and got you to forget about this 90% overlap, okay? Then it bounces a little, fails, comes back up. So when it comes back up, remember, you cannot take this at 5150 either. Why? Lower pivot high, lower low. This is not the area you take a buy setup in. Comes back up, you take it at $52, maybe because it's finally taking out this pivot, but you still have to worry about this area to the left. This is a tough one. I don't know if I would have taken it at 52 with a stop at 51, 60, or 70. Moves up, pulls back, and goes higher. Wow. Guys, as a general rule, when in doubt, stay out. When in doubt, stay out. There will always be stocks that you question yourself on. Every single day it will happen. And you know, well, this is less than perfect. But, you know, I haven't taken a trade in two days and blah, 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 blah. And you talk yourself into it. I always use Cliff as a great example because the guy averages like one to two trades a day. And he rarely loses because he only he picks high quality stuff and he's not manipulated by a bottoming tail or a topping tail or a stronger market or this or that. And he's like clockwork for 200, 250 R a year. Every year is like clockwork. So why put yourself in this position? Ask yourself this every time you take a trade. Is this the absolute unequivocal best that I can find right now? Most of the time, the answer to that question is no. Most of the time, it's no. There's there's something else out there that's better. And then if you get to a point where this is the absolute best, then you got to ask yourself, is it good enough to take? It's the best I can find, and it's not that good. What does that tell me about the overall environment? It's the best I can find, and it's not that good. What should that tell you about your gap list and the overall environment in the market? Maybe take a step back. Many of you are too caught up in the fact that if I have to take a trade, I have to make money, but you're never thinking about you might lose money. Isn't it an interesting dichotomy in trading that before you take a trade, it's all about missing out on money, right? And then as soon as you get into the trade, it's all about missing out on money, meaning you're in it and now you're starting to question yourself. Should I have taken that trade? Maybe I should get out a little bit early, but you were jonesing to take that trade. You knew it wasn't that good, but you just, you had to push the button. You need to get rid of that. That emotion, you know, emotions that you're taking decisions based off of emotions and subjectivity. This is not a great chart. Is it the worst chart we've ever seen? No, it's certainly not a really good chart. Why take it then? Right? You want to take stuff like this. 
Stocks in a downtrend, bounces, retest, bounces, retests. Would I buy the retest? No, it's a lower high. Rips, what does it do? Takes out this pivot and this pivot. So it puts in a higher high, taking out this pivot, taking out this pivot. This is a relatively smooth pullback. So the move back up into this area, 20 to 25, should be a relatively smooth move. Puts in a higher high, pulls back sequential pullback, lower high, lower high, lower high, bottoming tail doji bar, 50% retracement. This is a beautiful entry. This is a transitionary buy setup on a double, triple bottom retest. So you're going from a stage four downtrend into a stage one double, triple bottom retest back into an early stage two, but you're not in the stage two yet. You're between stage one and stage two, which is a transitionary period. It's a beautiful buy setup. 50% overlap, nice green bar strength, 50% retracement, bottoming tail doji bar rip. First target is the topping tail. Second target's way up here at like 26, whatever that area is. It's beautiful. We're not in the uptrend yet, but we're getting there. We have one higher high and one higher low. We have another higher high. You need one more higher low here to actually be in the uptrend. But that's what you should be taking. That is a no-brainer. This, man, you're tilting your head sideways. And you're like, well, should I or shouldn't I? I know what this is wrong with it, but... You're trying to convince yourself to take a trade that you know isn't that good. Why? FOMO. You think you're going to make money every time you push the button. That's the only reason. And one last comment before we end this, okay? Always check multiple time frames. <laughs> we talk about it frequently. I've done whole entire lectures on it. Always check multiple times time frames. If you trade this buy setup on MU in a vacuum, get a little three bar play and you're like, "Ooh, look at this bottoming tail. I might buy it. You're not buying it anymore. Save yourself the trouble and the struggle. This was tempting you. Now it's no longer tempting you. Think about it. This was tempting you and it should lower high, lower high, sequential move lower bottoming tail. There's some support there. It would have been better if it had stopped right above and you're, Oh man, should I, shouldn't I? Boom. Look at the higher. Nope, never mind. I'm done. Move on. That's it. You're up one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight bars up. This green bar is this entire move up right there. No thanks. And there's a pivot to the left. How many of you have done this before? Taken a buy setup that looked good or a breakout that looked good. And then you, a after you're in it, looked at the higher time frame, you're like, shit. It's either extended or it's sitting right at support or a bunch of slop or whatever. We've all done it, probably. But the question is, how often do you continue to do it after you learn that lesson? How many times did you have to learn that lesson? This is just an egregious example. Don't do it. It makes your decision making much easier because... For a second there, when you're trading in the vacuum, you had a tough decision. This is a pretty nice buy setup. But as soon as you looked at the 60, boom, decision's been made for me. Okay, decision has been made for me. All right, so I hope that you guys learned a little bit about objectivity, buy setups, clean ones versus sloppy ones versus trying not to use intuition and trying to look for reasons not to take a trade instead of always looking for reasons to take a trade. I know the preponderance to want to push the button because when you're new, you think pushing the button equals dollars. But when you're new, the truth is the opposite is more relevant to you. The more opposite, it happens more frequently. When you push the button, there's a higher chance that you'll lose money when you're new, which means you should push the button less often. But you do the exact opposite. Ever think about that for a second before I let you guys go? Experienced traders take fewer trades. Inexperienced traders take more trades. It should be the opposite. Experienced traders know what they're looking for, and they're good at finding what they're looking for. And if anyone should take an extra trade or two, it's somebody with experience and profitability. New traders should be doing the opposite. Now, granted, taking more trades helps gain experience at a price, at a cost. All right. So just remember, institutions, they have agendas. And those agendas, well, they don't include you. They include taking advantage of you, but they don't include helping you. The only thing you don't want to put yourself in the position of, and it's the most important thing in trading, is the position to where you are manipulating yourself. You're lying to yourself. 
You know what your tr pre-trade checklist says. You know what your plan says. You know what the chart's saying back at you, but you don't care. You just lost on a trade and you need to get your money back. Doesn't work that way. All right. So I hope you guys learned a little bit about that. I'm Jared Wesley of Live Traders. We'll get back at it again next week.